Welcome to Crimson Guitars, welcome to my home studio and welcome to episode 48 of Luthier's Question Time, uh, a live streamed, live stream and soon to be podcast on guitar building and pretty much everything and anything that anything goes. Here we are. Ask me a question or four and, uh, and we'll get on all right. Uh, first of all, uh, Marsha Levine is in the building. She says she's been spending her day uh, her day off watching uh, sh the sharpening series. I assume maybe my sharpening series. Uh, OMG, Ben has corrupted me completely. Now, as I've discovered another thing I must have and can't afford, Shapton glass stones. You can do without them. They are amazing, uh, but overkill. I mean, it's something to, to aspire to, but to be frank, uh, if you're getting into sharpening by hand, uh, the uh, the scary sharp system, if you're using the correct 3M papers and all that, is actually just as good, if not better in some ways. Um, Japanese, uh, Japanese water stones are softer and need a little bit more care in keeping them flat and level, but they are uh, much, much cheaper and uh, will last you for decades. I, my thoughts have changed since I filmed that series a long time ago, but, but it's all good. Jess Guitars is in the building, uh, Creverai, uh, Garage Master Guitars, Lisa, Lisa, uh, Lisa's going to be in. She's on and off tonight. Uh, she says she's been fixing a laptop all week. I'd forgotten one of the most important things when dealing with small stuff. She said, waiting for somebody to bite. I'm biting. Tell me what you're thinking. Uh, if it's uh, uh, safe for work. Um, questions. Tutum Carmen says, boo. Uh... Rab Knox says that I'm always late, so I started 30 seconds early. I think there's a 30 second delay uh, between what I say and what you actually see. So if I start exactly on time, which I do regularly, I, I am I'm feeling somewhat maligned here. I'm I'm I like time. Uh, anyway, I started a little bit early, so hopefully uh, it worked out spot on for you. Let me know if that's the case this time. I have uh, literally, I've been back home for 15 minutes. I've just had a, a, an awesome day out um, with the kids and, uh, and, and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing going from that, uh, the domesticity and... Uh, uh, and everything involved with children and, and schools and nonsense to to you wonderful people good evening okay okay so uh se guitar says one minute early but creever i said just 10 seconds early so i didn't time it quite right i'm gonna go f i'm gonna try and work that out next time to be exactly precise just for fun just for fun indeed Okay. Well, so the whole point of this entire thing is that I am able to uh, answer your questions on guitar building and uh, luthiery and business and pretty much anything else you fancy asking. So uh, please ask away. Here is a question from Paul Williams. He says, uh, building a six string fretless bass, what combination of truss rods and carbon fiber rods do you recommend? 16 millimeter string separation. Can I use single action or are double action a necessity? Uh, I personally believe that double action truss rods are a necessity in any build that you do, apart from potentially a classical guitar, uh, where the tensions are just orders of magnitude less, I suppose. Uh, in my opinion, it is not... It is possible to build a guitar that doesn't even need a truss rod, forgetting the fact that you know adjustment is is, uh, is a good thing. 
from a strength point of view, uh, I can I can design it so that when I put the frets in, it pushes it back enough so that I've still got the relief when the tension. Yeah, you know, I can think about all these things and be pretty spot on eight times out of ten, or nine times out of ten, or seven times out of ten. But wood is what it wants to be, and to be frank, it will mess you around. So, to be frank, dual action all the time and it is there as a safety blanket if things go wrong if the neck moves you've got a little bit more to play with than otherwise and it doesn't cost any more in time it maybe costs a little bit more in initial I mean not very much more at all so yeah that's what I would say now carbon fiber uh, stiffening rods as well. It's a six string base. It doesn't have frets and that's the interesting thing. Frets actually add a lot of strength to a neck. You have uh, small slots into which you push a slightly fatter um, bit of metal and that as I mentioned earlier will compress the neck backwards. You've got 22 or 24 of them depending on what you're building or 21 or 27. There are crazy people out there. And all of those things are pushing against the tension of the string. So a fretless instrument doesn't have that. So just going fretless means you need to think a little bit more about strength. I would have... Uh, you should be okay with a good quality dual action truss rod in a nice, tight, well-routed um, cavity. And two good quality carbon fiber stiffening rods um, on either side of them eight ten millimeters apart if you really want to go crazy have three carbon fiber rods and two truss rods but i don't think two truss rods dual truss rods are not necessary in this case i would suggest your carbon fiber stiffening rods need to be rectangular in cross section not just squares uh, we use squares a lot at Crimson, but we're also very confident that our uh, timber, etc., is um, totally perfectly dried and well up to snuff. If you're buying things in uh, Go Rectangle, uh, it has more strength. <sighs> and quite frankly, we haven't found a, uh, a cost-effective supply of rectangular um, carbon fiber stiffening rods for use. I think I walked through a spider web on the way down here. Okay, so uh, well, there we go. the The one element of this question that wasn't written down by Paul was the construction method. I'm going to assume that you are building this out of a multi laminate uh, construction, i.e., purple art and maple or, or walnut and mahogany with veneers and things in there if you are not if you are building this instrument with just a solid piece of wood just one solid chunk of wood for the neck make sure it's quarter sawn and in that case i would maybe have a single truss rod down the middle and four carbon fiber stiffening rods because <sighs> at that point you 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 would be needing some i'm sure Okie dokie. Uh, Marsha Levine. Marsha, I've got a letter from you that I haven't opened yet. Um, I'm very much looking forward to that, and I wanted a, a time where I actually had the time to do it uh, that I wasn't going to be interrupted, and that hasn't happened this weekend. Um, but anyway, um, I've been using... Uh, sorry, Marsha sent a $5... Super chat. Super chats are the way to absolutely ensure that I see your question. She says, I've been using Scary Sharp type system. I want to switch to stones slash ceramics with as much sharpening as I must do for fine hand carving. Okay. Um, that is the one thing. If you're doing a lot of sharpening, then yes, the Scary Sharp does get expensive. Uh, more expensive than the sharp than the Shapton stones even uh, over a, a long period of time. Uh, however, you are specifically talking about fine ha <clears throat> fine hand carving. Excuse me. 
And uh, if you haven't yet watched the video where I talked about sharpening gouges, that is the one that you need. So uh, with most gouges, it's it's not flat. And uh, in fact, sharpening gouges on the Scary Sharp system as well is also a problem. I would suggest a Japanese Waterstone combination set, uh, 800 grit and 1200 grit with two 800 stones. So essentially you've got um, an 800 grit stone, a 1200 grit stone and another 800 grit stone. And if you rub them together every single time you use the stones, both the 800 and the 800 and the 800 and the 1200, leaving one of them as the reference stone that you're not sharpening with, that will uh, self-level all the stones. When you see these granite um, setting up stones, um, what do we call them? Wow, I've forgotten the word for this. Uh, I sell them in, in metal as well. Uh, they are perfectly flat to within microns and the way they do it is some diamond paste and they just rub these two massive stones together until they're flat. Um, high spots are knocked off by the other stone and vice versa and, and that's the same process here. Uh, now you you're sharpening gouges and things which are uh, curved strange shapes and not no gouges match other gouges. They're all different and, and strange and uh, the system I use is uh, take that gouge uh, once it's got an edge on using your, your coarser stones, you then use that gouge to knock a hole in a piece of wood, uh, in the top of a piece of soft wood, and you use uh, a, a chrome polish, and you've then got a custom, a custom bit of wood that is the exact shape you need, and you can then burnish using the polish. Um, to get exactly what you need and it's much faster than messing around with solid stones or flat stones at least so that combined with a slip stone which is a small teardrop shaped stone is all you really need uh, now <laughs> he says looking around i have a a chunk of wood somewhere and i can't find it now i brought home a tool and essentially it's a rectangle uh, it's a it's a cone with leather on the top and it's lots of different radiuses going up like a miniature radius fretboard and that is for doing the insides as well uh, i'll show you that on a uh, on another video uh dennis chamarkin has sent 100 rubles thank you very much and says uh, question slide potentiometers on a guitar yay or nay damn fine question um I love the look of slide potentiometers. They are easily available, uh, relatively inexpensive, and uh, yeah, you can get these things quite quite easily. Hell, you probably have an old analog mixer floating around. I don't know if they've got 500k mixers uh, slide pots in there, but it's worth a look if it's a, if it's a scrap thing. Um, the only issue with them is. Playing guitar in anger is oftentimes a sweaty old business. And uh, one of those slide pots, if you, for example, get a glass of beer thrown at yourself or um, rip open your cuticles because you're playing so ferociously, uh, stuff tends to get into them. And I think you will have a lot more uh, physical failures of the potentiometer in a much shorter space of time than a comparable uh, standard rotary pot. Uh, is that an issue? Is it? It's. I don't think it's going to be every other gig. Uh, it's not even necessarily going to be every year or two or four, but it is something to be aware of. So if you go down that route, uh, I would suggest that you buy spares and if it's a guitar you're selling, send a couple of spares with the customer and just say, look, these things are cool as, but you're going to probably need to replace them. So here's a spare or two over time. Uh, you could even helpfully solder on the few wires or whatever. Uh, so it's a relatively easy um, plug and play kind of a job. Other than that, they look cool. 
They work well. They give you a much better visual cue as to where your settings are. I suppose the real question is, are pots required at all? 100% and 100% is the default. <laughs> as I get older, I use the tone control a lot more. Uh, anyhow, uh, Marsha says, hooray, I'm so glad I got there. It has, and uh, I am going to sit down tomorrow and, uh, and reply. Um, so there we go. Garage Master Guitar says, I've got a 400 slash 1000 grit faithful diamond stone. Uh, and then finer water stones. I use the 400 for keeping the water stones flat. That is a good point. Um, my, uh, I have, I'm very, very lucky. I do this YouTube thing and I get, you know, people send me things. And uh, I did a deal with a local supplier of Shapton stones many years ago where, you know, he sent them to me. And I said, if I like these, yeah, I'll do a video about them. I, of course, fell in love with them, I, and I knew I would because they are they are the best of the best of the best. Uh, I, I sincerely don't think that there is... Uh, I think I've heard of one viable alternative, but I didn't pay for them. The real question is, would I? Would I pay that price? And I'm even though they are amazing, there are more cost-effective systems in the short term that I would probably go for first. Uh, now, the other thing is they do sell a very expensive diamond stone for the leveling of the Shapton stones, and I was also given one of those. And uh, every time I use it, I'm like, wow, that's expensive, yo. Yeah. But incredible. Uh, now, the only difference between that and your faithful diamond stone is the fact that mine has, uh, has looks like the Death Star. There's giant canyons through which you can, you can fly before you let loose. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that clears the slurry away from the stones that you're, uh, that you're leveling. Uh, whereas the faithful one is just a solid block of steel with, um, with diamonds. Uh, impregnated into it. Uh, the one thing to be aware of, I had that, uh, I think that exact stone, or maybe one by Trend, and I lent it to an apprentice who left it in water, and it rusted. It was terrible. And, uh, yeah. That apprentice is no longer with us. And I'm not saying that he left the company, I'm saying he's no longer with us. <laughs> Uh, I can't say things like that. I have head tattoos. Okay. Um, Cal Style has sent five US dollars. Thank you very much. And said building a hollow electra acoustic. Not bent sides. Pulling a magnetic. Uh, I'm putting a magnetic pickup at the neck. Uh, the apple tree is throwing apples at my uh, windows somehow, which is. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, I'm putting a piezo, I'm putting a magnetic pickup at the neck and a piezo under the saddle. What type of magnetic pickup would you recommend? Oh, uh, honestly, seriously, what sound do you want? Um, the, the, the construction is going to make a difference. Yes, you have got an electroacoustic, electroacoustic, uh, the way you wrote that, which I really like. And uh, that means that there, is, there are probably F holes. You have uh, a lot of weight relief and uh, it's going to change the tonal response of the guitar. And, uh, and that is going to affect, to a certain extent, what comes through the pickup. Um, but in the end, if you go on Seymour Duncan's website and with good headphones, listen to what it says on the website or what each pickup does on the website, you will get very close electroacoustic notwithstanding to the sound that you want and, and that's what I would suggest um, you know I could very well turn around and say hey go and uh, go and get yourself a, a, a nice uh, foil mini humbucker uh, because you know I mean they look cool as and they have a very particular sound but they have a very particular sound and you might not like that sound so unfortunately in this case I have to say hashtag you do you and uh, experiment. Uh, or, what am I doing? Go and buy a Crimson Guitars pickup just because, hey, I'm going to profit from that. 
Um, <laughs> okay. Sweet tea guitars. This is a good question. Uh, how many guitars should I have in process at any given time without it becoming overwhelming? I want to build at least 10 in 22, including my GGBO build. Thank you for inspiring me. It's an absolute pleasure, and thank you for giving me the excuse to continue doing this. If you guys weren't watching and interacting um, and super chatting and all that jazz, this just wouldn't happen. It just could not. Uh, I would have to have a real job somewhere. So, so yeah. Now, <sighs> this is another one of those more personal things. How many guitars should I have in process? I I used to work in batches of five, or at least I tried to work in batches of five, and I would do every job and work through and end up with maybe three of them finished at the same time because of various issues. Uh, but it felt very... It For me, it sucked a lot of the fun out of building guitars. I do this because it's fun. I've managed to make it make a living, but I still do it because it's fun. I don't. I don't have to film the YouTube videos. I don't have to even be in a workshop. I don't have to use hand tools. Uh, we we've got. Yeah, you know, one of the largest, if not the largest, by dint of how many people come through our, our school, guitar building schools in the world. We teach more students per year than anybody else that I've ever heard of. And, you know, quite frankly, if I was working in there, I would probably be making more money. We'd probably have more students come. And the same thing goes with the tools. If I was R&Ding new tools every single week, I'd have more tools to sell and therefore the company would be doing better and I could probably pay myself a bit more. I don't because I love what I do. So what I'm trying to say with this horrendously long meandering statement is you you need to keep it fun. And it's not about, hey, I need to build 10 guitars because I need to build 10 guitars. It's about I'm enjoying this build. I'm enjoying this part of the build. Uh, I'm going to do this and see it through to completion. I personally think that having two guitars on the go at any one time is probably actually about right. Uh, if, you, if you're careful with where you go, if you're careful with where you start each, each build, you will always have something that you enjoy doing to look forward to in the very near future. Whereas if you are only doing finishing on a batch of five guitars, that could very well be a whole month's worth of, if you don't enjoy it, drudgery. You know, fine sanding, finish sanding, wet sanding, five whole guitars, including necks and headstocks and all that jazz. Whoa. You know, I enjoy doing it for one guitar. I can put up with two or maybe three, but doing five at a time with no let up, not being able to do any inlay work for six months, and then suddenly having to do a hell of a lot of inlay work over a two month period, um, both I miss the inlay work, and then by the end of that two month period, I hate inlay work because I'm doing too much of it. So bear that in mind. Um, but I do think that having, you know, having jobs that you don't enjoy to do with, but knowing that you've got another guitar, which is at a stage that you do enjoy, uh, just around the corner, it gives you something to look forward to. Delayed gratification. Um, and there we go. Okay. Creeveri comes and says uh, to uh, at Marsha Levine that Matthew did the math in my Scary Sharp video. This is the one where I did it with uh, Matthew from Workshop Heaven um, in the Scary Sharp video. And compared to Diamond Stones, it would take about 20 years to even out. Now, Matthew's biased. He sells the Scary Sharp system. I'm sure he sells stones as well. Uh, it does depend on what you're doing. And in Marsha's case, uh, if she is doing carving tools 
the scary shop system is phenomenal for chisels and plane blades where you put them into a um, into a honing guide and just go for it because it's there it's one bevel it's flat you just you know backwards of wash to the other side you're done a gouge you've got all of this um, strange motion and movements to try and match the shapes etc um, and you are going to go through a whole hell of a lot more of the uh, uh, scary shop polishing media um, the paper than anything else so in, in that case I would suggest you know sharpening stones and, and if it's not if you're not even doing anything with with chisels and plane blades you don't even need to bother sh flattening them I would keep the scary shop system you've got four chisels and plane blades and get uh, some Japanese water stones for gouges personally you can also get water stone <sighs> cones uh sort of a pyramid with different curves inside internal and external uh, for doing gouges which is uh, really useful and you all know that i've got several hundred carving tools just off the side here so uh, yeah not that i use them enough sweet tea guitars says a piece of float glass with wet dry sandpaper attached with spray adhesive works great once you get above 1000 grit uh, to a certain extent, every time I've ever tried that, I've just ripped through the, the wet and dry. Whereas the engineered stuff made by 3M, it's uh, it already has a, a very, very good quality adhesive coating on it. And uh, it keeps it just perfectly flat to the float glass. So, yeah. Now, um, Alan Wood says surface plates, question mark. Exactly, surface plates. Thank you very much. Okay. Carol Wood uh, says, hello, Ben. Hello, Carol. Um, ben, can you please tell me why resonator guitars are so expensive? As of today, I'm looking at one twice as expensive as my Les Paul knockoff. Thanks. Um, yeah. In the end, essentially, it is 95% of an acoustic guitar. Yeah, it's probably egging it a bit too much it, it's say 85 percent of an acoustic guitar because the top doesn't have the bracing that you would normally have on an acoustic uh, it has different bracing but uh, so you're saving a little bit of time and effort uh, by not bracing a nice top uh, you immediately lose that in the amount of time and effort it takes to create the resonator section which is um, spun steel steel i think they're steel which is chrome plated and all that do you know what if i wanted to send a, a custom bridge that i make here on my milling machine off to be chrome plated and it's a one-off it would cost me probably more than a commercially available bridge just to get chrome plated uh and don't even talk to me about gold plating so so yeah it just is the way it goes um with everything involved it's a complex construction and there is much more hardware in it than an average acoustic instrument so they're a bit more expensive uh lisa asks how much for the nebula pickup please i'm not entirely sure but it's probably going to be a tad pricier it's going to be a tad pricier than if you were to commission or ask for one of our single um a single one of our uh, classic hookers, for example, the humbuckers that we that we manufacture. So they're probably going to be somewhere around about ninety-five pounds a piece or thereabouts, I would say. Um, that is me erring on the side of a little bit more expensive than I would like. Uh, there's a lot more handwork involved and uh, CNC time. Uh, we're manufacturing them from scratch essentially. Um, however we will know s relatively soon. I'm waiting to see what this one sounds like in Nebula and uh, uh, we'll go from there now uh, since i've mentioned nebula i must say that i fully planned on on finishing her this week and uh, the the final video was supposed to be yesterday uh, you saw a random video where i did a saw restoration that was just in the bag 
uh, while I was waiting for some parts for Nebula. And the reason that happened is... <sighs> I like cliffhangers. No. Uh, basically, the... I had... I impregnated a... A, a nut into the top of this guitar early on in, in the build assuming that I would be able to from the inside install um, a, a stacked pot basically a center to tent pot that did not work because the center to tent pot just does not work with the the, the wiring system that I've got with the uh, uh, acoustasonic system from graph take it just doesn't it's not a viable thing so i had to then go to a stacked pot which was two concentric volume pots stacked on top of each other we ordered some they arrived uh, two or three days later and were a completely different um, thread to the nut that i'd installed so i drilled that nut out put my uh put my potentiometer in where am i putting this and it wouldn't fit. And at that stage, I have to now custom make uh, essentially an external... No, I need to custom make a, a, a beautiful nut to go into the guitar body so that I can uh, um, put the guitar together and it didn't work and I didn't have the tools they've now arrived and uh, I think I need to just double check with myself that it's all the right size but uh, it is what it is hopefully next week anyhow we've got a, a ten dollar super chat from Mad Mizaki thank you very much I haven't seen you for a while uh, uh, the question is I have a neck that has a 24 fret board with 23 and 24 hanging overhanging the heel so even 23 is over that sounds um yeah quite extreme to be honest wood gluing a piece and matching it to the heel work i'm going to be setting it uh thank you for all you do uh okay so essentially you've got say 15 millimeters or 20 millimeters overhang off the end of your neck i'm assuming that the neck is in the right place i.e the neck pocket and all that is in the correct place uh, to be honest if you're gluing it i would say just glue it so that the extension is flat down onto the the body uh, make sure it's all at the right angle, of course, so that you've got the brake angle for the bridge, etc. But it sounds like it should be fine. Uh, if... And to be frank, even if that section was just hanging, floating free, I don't think you would have any issues. Um, so, no, if you want to, glue a piece underneath it, uh, match it to the back of the neck heel, and essentially make the... Uh, make the... the the, the heel of the neck 10 millimeters longer that will always it will always be obvious that something has happened there without seeing photos i can't really say much more uh, but it doesn't i don't think you will have an issue by just having a 20 mil section of rosewood or ebony uh, floating off the end it might look a little strange but probably not as strange as um, seeing the witness marks on the treble side of the guitar where you've glued in an extra piece if that's all going to be hidden glue an extra piece in if you have to move the neck backwards because that's in the wrong place you're going to have to glue a piece in and hopefully it's hidden inside of the body depending on the shape of your horns basically uh, send me an email with a photograph of it of of what the problem is to stream at crimsonguitars.com and uh, Stephen will reply on my behalf uh, I'll, I'll have a look at the things and he'll he'll get back to you. And we'll go from there. Woohoo! <laughs> Paul Williams says, Your shop doesn't seem to stock the carbon fibre rods you recommended. Where do you get yours from? We 
I'm surprised we don't sell it. We we use four millimeter square sections. I would rather we had four millimeter by six millimeter rods, but nobody we approach will make them for us. And uh, I don't actually know where to get those. So yeah, drop us an email, shop at crimsonguitars.com. Tell them that Ben said that he would sell me some carbon fiber stiffening rods and I will sell you the four by four, which are perfectly fine. They do their job. Um, it just could be a little bit stronger. So there we are. Carl Stahl says, lol, great answer. I don't know, buy what you want. <laughs> it is true. Okay. Uh, Nick Guitar says, for GGBO 21, have you considered using using carbon fiber rods okay i understand uh for my for the guitar that i built for ggbo 21 have you considered using carbon fiber rods to connect to plates uh yes absolutely i would like to use carbon fiber tubes i.e grab an old carbon fiber fishing rod or badminton rack or something like that chop it up as sacrilegious as that might be and use that that could be fun uh, another question, how would you connect them without a joint being noticed on the outside surfaces? It's quite simple really, you need to just drill a hole halfway through and make sure that the glue uh, in there is strong enough. An alternative is to have uh, a solid rod that has a step in it. So you've got say an 8 mil section and then the rod itself is 10 mil giving you the, the, the bottom of the cavity, the side walls of the cavity, and actually a little bit around the, the top of the cavity to glue to, and that would be fine. And once you once you do that 10 or 20 times, that's more than enough uh, gluing surface to hold the whole instrument together under tension. It's, it's amazing how little you actually can. It is amazing that you don't need as much glue slash gluing surface as most people think nowadays if you're using the correct glue. So there we go. Alrighty. Whew. Questions. Three at a time. Three a time, that's from what Rab says. Can do. Oh, here we go. We have some uh, we have some questions uh, via Discord, etc. that I haven't got to yet. Inky Guitars via our Discord. If you haven't been on our Discord, please go to it. Hi, Ben. I'm planning to build an acoustic and was wondering whether a wire frame around the back and sides would make it louder by isolating the vibrations from the body. I know what you're talking about. Uh, it would be shaped and made to look nice as well. Also, when will we be able to buy Bob Oak fretboards from Crimson? I need to dry some of that. Uh, we're in the process of um, looking at that. But uh, send us an email, shop at crimsonguitars.com and uh, just say, hey, I want some. And uh, if there's an actual order or two waiting, we will be able to um, send it through the dryer a little bit faster, i.e. sooner. Um, but there we go. To answer your question, yes. Essentially, think about it like um, those people that build ultra high end uh, record players, and they have um, these noise isolating cones that uh, touch right at the tip. And that's the only thing that, that connects this heavy player that's built on a granite base or whatever uh, from everything else surrounding it. So I would suggest get some of those cones or something like that, have as few points of contact as possible, and then use those to isolate the wireframe or another piece of wood. You can have a separate back, for example. I've, people have shown me ideas for this sort of thing many times. In fact, some of them might have even gone into, into production. And the thought is absolutely valid. Um, you could go to the nth degree and build a, um, a frame around the neck. So have a smaller neck that's vibrating and your hand isn't 
is touching something that's floating just a little bit away from the neck and then the whole instrument will vibrate more because you're not damping it down with your belly or your hand um your forearm so yeah technically should be amazing in reality is it worth the, the effort I'm not so sure um but yeah it's all it's all fun and games <sighs> Jeroen Verhoeven says question besides Robert Fripp uh, which well-known guitarists are using crimson guitars uh, and are crimson guitars stage proof uh, even Robert Fripp is not showing his when performing with Toya on Sunday mornings Robert has so many nice guitars and he has I love Robert I'm a huge fan of his he's an incredible person as well as artist but damn if he's difficult to please um he likes the guitars I made for him. He raves about them when he's talking to me. He doesn't play them as much as I would like because he is so in love with the guitars that he had before. Um, and I think it's it's just one of those things. You've got a sort of 40, 50 year career and then uh, you move on to somebody else. And... Uh, um, yeah, you've still got these guitars that he absolutely loves, uh, which, I don't know, it's a pity that he's not using Crimson all the time, uh, but it just is what it is. And I fully understand, you know, I've got tools that, uh, that I go to time and time again, even though, you know, hell, there's sponsors who've asked me to use um, X, Y, or Z. These are the first chisels that are not ones that I bought from Ashley Isles because and I've been offered chisels by probably four or five different brands and it's always like yeah I'll try them oh, sorry I really don't like them I'm not going to promote these and it's the same thing with guitars um, if it's if it's not the best of the best of the best if it's not the tool that you grew up and love um, you know you'll play it you'll enjoy it it'll do the job but it's not that 59 minutes Paul or um, the Bernie. He, he loves this Bernie. It's a Japanese guitar. It just is his thing. So anyway, that's that. Um, Charlie Jones, Gold Fraps, bass player. I built him a bass. Um, oh, various other bits, uh, various other people, but it's, it's not. I wish that I could say Clapton or um Bonamassa or you know any of these big things and it just isn't what we do we're a much smaller company and yeah most of the people who play our guitars are either um you know gigging studio musicians that nobody's really heard of uh, or guys who want a really high-end guitar and they, they play in their bedroom or maybe down the pub uh, once or twice a month so uh, yeah watch the space we'll, we'll, we'll see um, and our Crimson Guitar stage proof, 100%, uh, emphatically, uh, and yeah, uh, we, we build really, really good guitars. Um, seriously, watch this space. There are some very interesting things coming uh, on the guitar front uh, in the not too distant future. Carl Style is talking about buying various different pickups to see what sound he likes. The other thing to do is find a pickup that's broadly the right sound and then experiment with capacitors and uh, uh, and see how you can shape the sound in that way as well. Whew. Okay, uh, Tutum Carmen. Uh, hey Ben, pickup height, is there a correct way to set them or is it just whatever sounds best? You don't want to be too close. If you've got a high output pickup with strong magnets uh, the closer you get to the strings the more you attenuate the vibration of the strings because the magnetic field is pulling and pulling on the string and dampening it so four or five millimeters away around about four millimeters is, a, is pretty much where you need to be but you should notice a difference in sustain um, and yeah that's it just find out where is too close 
Uh, Rocket Punk says, Hey Ben, there will be a concert in Strasbourg in France where the folks will play on instruments made out of wood from the giant fur from the Christmas market. Ha! Cool. I know people are reluctant about fur in Luthiery, but they are also but they also are about oak and it sounds amazing. The issue with oak is it's relatively boring looking, I personally feel. Uh, European oak at least. And it's heavy. I cannot sell heavy guitars. People do not buy heavy guitars. Fur makes light guitars. Uh, and I'm already using spruce on my guitars for the sustain, the looks and the low price. So do you think fur could be a viable option for tone wood? Correctly quarter sawn and dry if I can find that, of course. Um, yes, 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 yes. You can make a guitar out of fur. And pretty much any other softwood. I will, however, still, and probably for the rest of my life, try and steer people away from that. Um, the weight, the weight is great, absolutely. No, no question. Uh, but it is very soft, and the finish is the problem. If you want a guitar that is going to look nice and flat and shiny and like something that people want to buy and own this coming from a man who builds the raw series guitars where i i revel in the knots and cracks and crevices in natural wood uh, the fur and those softwoods take dents and knocks and scuffs very very easily uh, the only finish that i found that really works with that sort of wood is uh, shusugi bun where you burn it and then oil and you've got that black ridged kind of look with the hard and soft grains and that looks really good and is also relatively hard wearing um, other than that unfortunately it just tends to look like a cheap guitar and uh, that's my real issue um that's that's my real issue with fur. Uh, it just looks cheap and it dents. So there we go. Vulcan Essen, how you doing, V? Uh, sent five euros and says, Hi, Ben. Will there ever be a Scion as a kit? Uh, no. Um, no, so this is, this is an issue with... Um, this is an issue with Crimson Guitars being a manufacturer of tools and kits as well as a guitar builder. I am actually going to be splitting, creating a new brand to build the guitars for exactly this sort of, of thing. People who buy high-end guitars aren't interested in buying high-end guitars associated with somebody who also makes kit guitars. People who buy kit guitars aren't in the market to buy a high-end guitar. And I don't blame you for asking 100%. But I, I'm, I can't sell a kit version of a guitar that I sell for nearly £3,000 to anybody else um, because it will, look like, it will look like a guitar that we've made. Um, you could commission it with the same inlays and all that jazz, but we are then trusting uh, everybody else that we sell it to to finish it to the same level of quality and the standard and the finish and the high gloss and all that jazz that we would do and uh, I just can't trust everybody to do that and it, it yeah it just runs the risk of damaging damaging our reputation which is what you live and die by really in the end so so no I've got no problem with you building your own version of it um, and that's that's one thing but to actually us to provide an exact kit, I don't think we, we could ever do that sort of thing. Um, it's a really difficult question. Anyway, uh, and also um, thank you for the tip, uh, Vulcan says. Isotunes are great. Smiley face. Cheers, V. Uh, yeah. I, I absolutely love them. I... <laughs> I use them all the time. 
and, and that's it. I was trying to count. I think I've had my isogenes in my head about four or five times today, and that's out of the workshop and, uh, you know, doing the dishes, plop the isogenes in. Shaving, plop the isogenes in. My razor's damn loud. But you didn't need to know that. And I also haven't shaved in far too long. Now, Creeve Rice says, laser cutter, CNC, and 3D printer. These are the things I want, but can't afford, slash have no space for, slash no skills with. Skills come when you've got them, and it's just a case of saying, do you know what? I'm going to learn this. Um, there we go. <laughs> Friendly Father says, do you ever feel silly because you have a tattoo on your head? And that looks like a, uh, um, that looks like a YouTube comment. Uh, really? No. Do you ever feel silly for judging somebody with tattoos on their head? Um, I, I get a lot of, a lot. I get a number of comments from people who immediately say that the tattoos show that I've, I'm not trustworthy and shouldn't, shouldn't be, um, listened to and my advice is not worth anything. And uh, unfortunately, that just proves that those people don't deserve to watch or learn from me. Um, if you're narrow-minded enough to have an issue with the tattoos, then quite frankly, piss off. Um, so, I regret certain things about the tattoos. I wish I had gone to a better tattooist. I wish that I had uh, a better idea on design early on, the, the bit in the middle. Is being covered over at the moment with something cooler, but that's you know problematic now because it's a cover up. And so yeah, I wish I'd done it better earlier. Other than that, no regrets, and no, I don't feel silly. John Stitt, we have been pining away for the completion of the Nebula Two. What happens when he finishes? We will be like the dog who chases after a car and finally catches it. Now what? Hmm. I ask thee to ponder such a question while sipping your favourite coffee, tea, or whatever. Uh, that was also a YouTube comment. I think... Oh, there's a couple of super chats. I think I've got you covered. The only thing that I can do... The only thing that I can do that can remotely compete with Nebula is 90 hour and hand tool build two things that uh, will be very very interesting two separate things as well uh, and they're going to be happening Kiwi Quarters how you doing sent five dollars and said hey Ben are we going to see a low end design from you uh, I love the 2020 and the GDBO 21, but I would worry about spiders living in them. Uh, yes, I am working on a whole range of new guitars that will be a lot safer. A little bit more vanilla, a lot more commercially viable and uh, easier to build. And uh, yeah, I have overcomplicated my life of late and I'm looking forward to uh, to pairing back a little bit in some ways yeah Zach Ellison how you doing Zach um, sent ten dollars thank you very much um, fresh hot biscuits and sausage gravy and ice cold milk if you sent a super chat you don't have to make me hungry it's, it's fine I, I can already see it the food things are there to, to draw my attention <sighs> fresh hot biscuits and sausage gravy and ice cold milk that actually sounds so many people don't understand how so important temperature is to food i don't understand people who can drink cold coffee ricky at the crimson guitars office he doesn't mind if it's cold or lukewarm or hot <sighs> i don't understand it anyway there is a question here uh, Zach asks, uh, or states, I'm considering building an explorer-shaped guitar. 
mahogany sandwiched between two maple caps and then comfort carving it. What do you think? Um, I think you should go for it. Right on. Uh, now, it is a hell of a lot of wood. And uh, I would suggest weight relief, especially if, you, if you've got a cap top and back. Work out where the relief carvings are going to be and all of that jazz. Work out if you even need relief carvings on an explorer. It, it depends on where you play. Down your knees. Um, but uh, I'm not so sure you need that much relief carving. Comfort carves, shall we say. Um, but yeah, sexy, sexy, sexy guitars. Uh, absolutely go for it. I want to build more Explorer types myself. I really do. Uh, Zach comes in immediately with another super chat saying, P.S. Uh, when I do send the little dollars I have to you here, it's because I feel that little bit is my way of paying you back for all your teaching online. Thanks. Dude, I really do appreciate it. Um, the... Uh, Okay, so I, I don't tend to talk about this sort of stuff um, very often at all. I, if ever, in public. So here we go, for the 86 of you that are currently watching, only 50 likes. Um, so the YouTube channel is wholly separate from Crimson Guitars. It is, it's owned entirely by me. And it was, it was my personal thing before the company even, even was doing YouTube for itself, I started it, it's me, it's mine. Um, the ad revenue and the super chat, it comes to me personally. So in in all seriousness, um, it, I really do appreciate it. And I, thank you very, very much. Uh, now I do portion um, parts of both of these things out to Crimson uh, to keep the whole thing going and, and all of that jazz. But the reason that I'm doing the super, the super chats, the reason I'm doing these live streams um, is partially because it is, you know, there's a, what, we've had 30, uh, I've got a thing here, about 35 pounds worth of super chats this evening. It It's worth my time on a financial, from a financial point of view to do this. Um, but quite frankly, the fact that you're saying thank you makes everything else I do worthwhile as well. If I wasn't getting the comments from people saying that they now build guitars because of uh, how easy I make it look, or they're into hand tools because of how giddy I get when I talk about hand planes and chisels and sharp tools and how much I love it, and that's what really does it. But uh, being able to turn around to my wife and say, do you know what, darling, um, you know, I just spent 50 quid with the children, um, taking them out for a day. But I came in and did a super chat, uh, did a super chat, did a live stream, and you know, that paid for that whole thing. Um, it, it's good. It, it's I'm not entirely sure if I should have said that. Probably shouldn't make the podcast, but anyway, there we go. <sighs> hmm. Alan Barnes says, Ben, sorry I can't watch right now. My two great granddaughters are here for a visit. Get off the computer and go and enjoy them. Uh, I will be watching as soon as they leave. I've already liked the smash button. Have a great week. Uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> 68 likes now. Thank you very much. You guys are great. Um, Creve Rice says, what about iced coffee? Again, that's exactly it. So yeah, iced coffee is meant to be cold. Lukewarm coffee, no. If it's been in the fridge for hours, fantastic. Um, I've recently started eating apples kept in the fridge, which is was a new one to me. And now I can't eat them if they're not lovely and cold because they're just so much better. Lukewarm Diet Coke, what the hell? Ugh. Uh, Vulcan Essence come back with five years. I said, hi, Ben. Um, Cyberpunk 2077. Did you ever figure out how to have pulsating LEDs without causing noise? Would shielding paint along the perspex have helped? No, shielding paint would not 
have helped at all. It was so... It was literally just the... Um, it is. I haven't actually fixed it yet. Can you believe it? <sighs> the proximity to the pickups caused that issue. Um, those LEDs that have the flashing built into it will make that noise near a pickup, period. Now, I could have a, uh, a, a mini computer brain kind of a thing going on in there, uh, taking normal LEDs and making them flash, fine. Uh, if I had the knowledge uh, and capacity to do that. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Now, uh, Brett G. Brown uh, says, and this is a long one, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to answer it. I have a question that's just been bugging the hell out of me and thought you could answer. When playing, I, playing guitar, I find that I prefer the smaller Gibson scale length, though I play the Fender scale length just fine. However, I really would like a more narrow neck. I find it just a little more difficult than I would like for my pinky finger to reach the low E string. So my question is, what is the relation between the neck width, the bridge spacing, and the pickup spacing? Are there pickups with a more narrow profile, and are there bridges or trems with a more narrow string spacing? Uh, no, basically not. Uh, you could take a tunematic bridge and you could uh, notch extra notches in uh, using a string spacing rule to bring the strings closer together. You could use a standard bridge and a much narrower nut to narrow down the whole thing a little bit more if you needed to. Um, and normal pickups should work. The magnetic field from the, the pole pieces is larger it's not going straight up in the sort of a, uh, a searchlight of a magnetic field. It's, it's, you know, round. So it's not round. You know what I'm talking about. So you don't necessarily need to play around with that. Uh, rail pickups are an option as well. Uh, I know that a humbucker has a spacing of 49.2 millimeters at the bridge and slightly less at the neck as the strings over towards the nut, but is there a way to get a smaller spacing so the neck can be more narrow at the 24th fret or 22nd and coincidentally at the nut? And if so, what about the bridge itself? Can you find a bridge smaller than the normal bridges or trams? Thanks in advance if you choose to tackle this topic. Uh, basically, you can make a custom bridge absolutely with less than the uh, uh, 9.5 mil spacing or 10 mil spacing that is standard. But uh, yeah. It's not something that is commercially required or asked for. So, yeah, customize it by all means. Uh, your best bet is reducing the nut drastically so that higher up it's, uh, it's less. <sighs> A custom builder should be able to do it for you, though. So we, for example, make custom pickups all the time. We can make pickups specifically for whatever spacing we want. It would involve some laser cutting and some CNC machining and custom base plates and things like that. But, you know, it's absolutely not beyond the realms of possibility. We do that sort of thing fairly regularly for other reasons. Uh, a bridge is much more problematic. We could customize bridges other than tunematics to have a more narrow spacing if necessary. Uh, but doing it as a... Yeah. I don't know. Go for it. Julia Child um, says, Upside down question marks always throw me for a loop. <laughs> what technique slash tool have you found to give you the best, most consistent results when rounding over an acoustic guitar's sound hole? Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, I don't build acoustic guitars any, anywhere near as much as uh, as I would like. Um, the okay, I'm going to use your words rounding over an acoustic guitar sound hole. So I'm going to assume you're not talking about actually cutting the sound hole. Uh, if you're talking about cutting the sound hole, the best of best of the best is a good quality Dremel or multi tool on a circle cutting jig, or a router, uh, and a circle cutting jig, etc. I think what you're talking about is actually rounding over the uh, the the sandal, so that that is now prettier, and 
well, better, basically. <sighs> In the past, I've only, I, all I do is sand it, essentially. Um, you're talking about spruce or western red cedar, where you've got these very hard spots uh, of lengths of grain and then very, very soft spots in between them. And if you've got, um, if you've got that, sanding tends to give uneven results. So the way that I do it is a, a good, hard uh, sanding block with minimal, if any, padding on it and a piece of sandpaper actually stuck to that and then you're not it doesn't want to go in between the, the hard grain and go where you don't want it to now you should be able to do the same thing using a round over cutter on a router at least to start everything but uh, you've also got a lot of grain direction and a lot of very soft grain there so take as little as you possibly can other than that, another option that I haven't tried, but now does occur to me, is a beading tool of some sort, i.e. a shaped scraper, uh, a blade that's got the radius that you want, and it's literally just scraping around. Um, and that, that would do, that would actually probably be, that would be the best tool for the job. There we go. How's that? Are we back again? Okay. <sighs> oh, we've got a, another super chat. So I think Are we back. I think we're back. Woohoo. Okay, fine. So it turns out I need to refresh uh, both the YouTube uh, screen and uh, stop and then start the screen again in the, uh, the software that we use. Uh, that is what happens when I, just with my finger, just touch the LAN cable. It's uh, just... Uh, anyway, I will avoid that now. Stian TV's come in with five euros and said, how thin could a base be built? And what are the deciding factors? Any plans for further base kits? Yes, emphatically. How might this affect the sustain? Thanks, as always. Uh, smaller, smaller instruments with uh, less material, etc. I prefer them. I think they sustain better. But there's always an argument over lightweight versus hard. So you can have, I don't know what the science actually says, and I probably should look into it, because they seem to be mutually exclusive, but in reality are not. A good, heavy, solid, chunky, heavy, heavy guitar has great sustain, and a really lightweight guitar made out of pine with carbon fibre on the outside or whatever, that has bags of sustain as well. It's in the middle where it sort of gets thuddy and weird, and I don't really understand it. I've never really given it proper thought either. And I call myself a guitar building YouTuber. My gosh. Okay. Uh, any plans for further bass kits? 100%. If you have any in particular that you want, seriously, drop us a line. We will custom build it for you uh, at the drop of a hat. Uh, we are adding kits at a rate of knots. And uh, the ones that get added are the ones that people have contacted us about. So, yeah, get in touch. How thin could a base be built? As thin as you like. The only real limiting factor is the depth of the pickups, and you can counteract that by height of bridge, and how strong the body actually is itself, i.e. you need to withstand the amount of tension on those strings. So uh, most bass bridges are not like guitar tremolos, where you have a fixed depth that it has to be, unless you're going uh, down the whole Kayla route, for example. Um, but, yeah. There we go. Uh, I, thin, thin, thin. And you could make a very thin guitar. I made a guitar out of Bubinga, and I had to make it as thin as possible just because of the weight. It ended up being 10 millimeters thick at the edges, about 25 or so uh, in the middle, 
and uh, it was still heavy, but yeah, turned out to be a lovely guitar. Dang Nabbit says, Ben, keep moving. Sometimes YouTube freezes and sometimes you just stand very still. And then I disappear. I'm not really here. Uh, okay. <laughs> Lewis Wingrove says, question, Ben, are bare knuckle pickups any good? Um, <laughs> I was one of Tim's earliest customers. Within the first year of him starting that company, um, I... I was one of his first customers. In fact, I bought pickups from the guy that developed his entire range of the first pickups that he ever sold under his brand were made by somebody else. Um, if I was told, if I believe what I was told. Um, but yeah, they are very, very, very good pickups. Uh, period. Don't ask me. Ask the guitarists who use them, and there are millions of them. It's what it is. Um, Tim is very, very good at marketing, absolutely. Uh, but they make incredible pickups. And uh, whenever there is an issue with the pickup, they're also good at sorting it out. So, yeah, go for it. <sighs> Lisa's saying, so are they on the website? Question marks with many question marks. I'm assuming you're talking about the uh, Nebula pickups. No, not yet. Uh, they will be, as soon as we're ready to actually sell them, they will be. If you want to send us an email to shop at crimsonguitars.com to put your name down for one, then we'll make sure that you get the first one off the press. Hell, I'll sign it for you if that makes any difference. Um, <laughs> it's always weird signing stuff, but uh, yeah, anyway. Okay. multi-laminate necks. Got some photos here. Okay, fantastic. Sven Clark uh, via our Discord says, I'm working on a replacement neck for my friend's old Mustang. Maple and cherry neck with a maple fretboard. We'll be painting and weathering the headstock to match the heavily used body. What would you recommend for a home builder to use as a finish? Rattle can poly? Nitro? Crimson melamine? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I'm a fan of oil finishes, if that helps anything. Um, oh. Basically, date the Mustang, and if you really want it to match, use exactly what was used by Fender at the time, which I think was probably poly covered by a thin layer of nitro. Um, however, so that's for verisimilitude. Talk to the client and see what he prefers. That's the most important thing. Wow. Uh, Max has sent me a photograph of a very long Cooper's plane. It's probably about a meter and a half uh, tall. That's really cool. Um, okay, this was via Crumpet, actually. Good evening, Ben. Today I went to a reclamation yard to buy a countertop for my workbench, and while I was there I found this huge plane. It had to be around six foot at least. Unfortunately, I didn't buy it, though I wish I could have. Update from last week. My tools are set to arrive tomorrow, so thanks to you and Ricky for your help. It's a pleasure. So, yeah, essentially it's a six foot long um, plane. They vary from sort of four and a half to five foot long, and it's a Cooper's plane. Essentially, it's a... Uh, a wooden block plane construction like you would use normally but uh, it's got a hole in the toe and they're actually used upside down so the base of the plane goes on the floor the hole has a stick in it or two sticks so you've got um, feet and it goes upside down and instead of pushing the plane over the work you push your staves your barrel staves over the plane they're incredibly cool I've got three of them at the Vintage Tool Shop or VintageToolShop.com at the moment. I'm not sure if they're actually on the website. I don't think they've been photographed and are up for sale yet, but uh, super cool. Super cool indeed. Okay. 
Uh, Spike via Discord says, Ben, the fake Fender update. I gave the kid an Epiphone Les Paul special for its straight trade. Figured he need I figured that he needed a decent guitar. I could make lots of content with this gender. Best way to help him out and me out. Can you tell me what kind of wood this is? Not from that photo, no. Um, it's under finish. It looks like... Well, it... Hmm. It looks like older or poplar or something like that, uh, i.e. what it should be. But um, uh, yeah, it's under finish, so I can't really tell. <sighs> okay. There is a super chat from Marsha. How are you, Marsha? Um, I don't understand most of the Luthier Q&A, but I could probably listen to you recite the phone book. Um, oh, shucks. And be entertained. Ben, I'm in it for the tools, as you know. However, hashtag always learning. Question mark. Okay, tools. So obviously you've just heard my bit talking about the, uh, um, the Cooper's plane. Well, now I need to find something interesting to talk about tool-wise. What is my favourite tool that you guys don't see regularly? I did some welding the other day for the first time, pretty much, like literally the second time in my life. It did not go well. Uh, I really need to learn how to weld and braze. Uh, that's a tool that I really, really want to use and learn. Here we go. This is one of my favorite tools that I don't talk about very much. And this is just for you, Marsha. So, I'm not sure if you can see. There we go. These are Lancashire pattern dividers. Well, dividers here. And... Uh, uh, and the best thing about these is that they are made out of a single piece of steel that was forged to have a spring. It's one piece. Uh, yeah, they're just unnecessarily beautiful. And uh, amazing. I love them. Uh, simplicity. Simplicity. And you're there. Okay. So, give me a question. Rad Knox says, how much should I pay for a whole abalone shell? Because I can get some at the Sunday market in Dorchester. Uh, and just wonder what they usually price at. Honestly, um three or four quid probably they're an absolute nightmare and very dangerous to um to prepare uh the the dust is a nightmare so and it's also very 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 hard stuff so filing pieces flat and cutting it out or grinding it flat etc you need water and yeah there's some people on youtube who show you how to do it and you need very, very good quality masks, for one. Uh, Dennis Chummer can come has come back in with another 100 rubles. Um, with a would you rather. There we go. Thank you very much. Would you rather build a guitar with the worst and mismatched woods you can find, or no wood at all? No wood at all. For the longest time, when I was just a custom shop, uh, and I was taking orders and building guitars, and that was how I was trying to make a living. Uh, I used to tell customers that I would build absolutely anything that they could dream of, as long as it played well, and I could be proud of how it looked. Because those, to me, are the most important things. I need to be proud of what I do, or I'm not going to do it. Uh, period. I don't care how much money... Somebody offered, 
an obscene amount of money for me to build a Bumblefoot guitar replica. I'm not going to do that. Um, so, so yeah, basically, no wood at all. I would really enjoy the challenge of making something entirely out of um, carbon fibres or composites or uh, foams or um, paper mache. That's paper, which is wood-based, so maybe not. How about cloth? How about... Um, yeah. Let's make a whole guitar out of... Uh, out of cloth that could be fun um, here's an interest uh, I, I was getting a, a cast I, I broke my foot <sighs> okay fat men should not <laughs> should not go paintballing this is a long time ago now but uh, I, I was I, I went paintballing and uh, this being England, it was wet and uh, the bell went or the whistle blew or whatever. And I ran and carried on going and realized that I wasn't going to stop to get behind the tree that I was aiming for. And I ended up going backwards with my full, not inconsiderable weight. I've actually lost weight since then. Uh, and sliding back way for a good three or four meters and my entire weight smashed into the he my heel onto a root. I then went and flipped and I, I broke a bone in, in my heel and, and they put a cast on me and stuff. But they used this amazing uh, cast material that um, was pre-preg, essentially pre-impregnated with the whatever it was. And you take it out of the package and that immediately starts it going off wrap it around and within five minutes you've got this really hard thing it's amazing and my first thought was wow i need to use that to make a guitar and this was way more than a decade ago and i still have not done that so yeah that's one to do anyhow okay <laughs> there's one of you who hasn't clicked like click like that'd be great um okay Uh, Lisa says, nope, are the new kits you mentioned on the website, please? Uh, I'm not sure where we sit with that, but there are new ones being um, being done and photographed on an almost weekly basis. So uh, check it. But again, uh, Lisa, if there is anything in particular that you want, please drop us a line. We would be more than happy to make it for you. Uh, so, yeah. Lindworm Guitar says, Ben, any update on the sparkly microcrystalline wax? I do need to find a company. Um, I've found three companies who can do it for us. And I don't know why we haven't moved forward with that. So uh, uh, I've just taken a photograph of that. I will talk to the guys at headquarters tomorrow. Presuming I have fuel enough to get to headquarters tomorrow. The UK is insane. We, we've got enough fuel in the country... To fill every single station it's not an issue but we don't have the bulk haulage drivers to get it to everywhere so it hit the news that some places were going to go without therefore everyone went out apart from me because i'm not an idiot and filled their vans and cars and stuff with fuel even if they needed to or not filled it up with with um their carrier things and all that jazz and suddenly there is a fuel shortage because nobody's got any and i actually i am down i'm a uh, less what an eighth of a tank and uh, my son's probably not going to be going to school this week if i can't drive him boo anyhow <sighs> brian thomas black dog vintage racing that sounds fun um can you stay in a fretboard darker 100%. Um, I would go with the Stunning Stains Spirit Stain, probably. Uh, I think that that goes in deeper, but also has... On a fretboard, I would be worried about... The Spirit-based stain off-gasses quite rapidly and doesn't leave things wet, whereas a water-based stain is water-based, so you're putting a lot of fluid on something that's already thin. And if something goes wrong and it starts moving 
I, I wouldn't suggest using it on 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 a neck on a fretboard at least sorry um hmm. interesting question uh but yeah spirit based stain and have at it you'll be fine Loy says, Ben, why no trim bridge on a base? Thanks. It has never, never, never been successfully done. I'll rephrase that. I have seen base tremolos before that worked absolutely fine. Musically, I can't think of anybody who's used one. Yeah period it's just it's all well and good that you can do this but if it's not going to have a place in uh, on the records or on the song uh, if it's not going to be something that is used uh, greatly by many musicians then there is no point um, uh, Matt Bellamy's uh, instruments with the XY MIDI pad system for example you know yeah we can do it I've made probably hell i personally have done at least 10 as a company we've probably done 20 but it's only for people trying to emulate matt bellamy he's the guy that does that and his fans and it's fantastic i mean hell he's an incredible musician like mind-blowing but you're not going to have an xy midi pad on millions of guitars being played by millions of guitarists um, in you know myriad different ways and and genres it's just not going to happen and the same thing I'm afraid is bass tremolos they're just not going to happen uh, yeah as much as I would like to experiment it's just not worth it okay I'm going to stop standing still Okay, Paul Williams says, "What's the lightest, lightest decent guitar you've made?" It was uh, the GGBO Twenty One, which is the best sounding guitar I think I've ever made, and she was just over two pounds, I think, two and a half pounds, something like that. Um, Robert R says, "On this about the hang-ups for people uh, that is not caused from Ben's side, depending on which browser you use, to try clearing the cache and updating the browser itself before starting the stream." Okay. Uh, Is a whole saw good for a wafered top? Whole saws are pretty good, yeah. Oh. Teddy says, uh, what are some dream materials you'd want to use to make a guitar without any wood? Something I often think about is uh, there are types of plastics that you can use that with a little bit of heat allow you to then mold anything you want. And I think you could do some pretty cool things with those. Except for the fact that they're plastics and I don't like plastic. I'm torn, I tell you. <laughs> okay. Come on then, feed me with questions, feed me with questions, and uh, let's see where we go. Nick Guitar says, how about a Cactus Juice tutorial for guitar? That is a good point, we will do that. We're in the process of experimenting with uh, a homemade um, vacuum chamber. Uh, once we've got all of that sorted, we will go through how we do it um, just for fun. Okay, uh, this has just come through from Redhead17. Uh, Redhead17 says, I've just mentioned it on the live stream tonight as you were talking about carbon fiber rods, but you didn't see my message or chose not to read it out. I, I Seriously, I only see about a quarter of the messages that actually come through. Uh, yeah. Huh. Okay. 
See, I, I've seen one. Uh, I have mentioned Driftwood guitars in a few streams before. Yes, I've, I've watched a few of the videos now. They are very cool. Um, they're very cool. Um, so I didn't want to mention them again as it is starting to sound like I work for them. Anyway, they used a D-shaped carbon fiber rod in place of a truss rod. Boo! Uh, in the guitar they made for Rhett Schull. You can see it in this vid at 710. He mentions a company called Dragon Plate in the US as the company that he gets their carbon fiber rods from. Uh, I hope it is something that could be what you were looking for as regards getting fiber rods to the specification you want. Uh, thank you very much. We do almost certainly have to find a UK company and uh, there are several that we've approached and it's just not a size that they do and we aren't prepared to place orders in the tens of thousands uh, it's something I need to look at a little bit more okay uh, and a d-shaped carbon fiber rod in place of a truss rod is sacrilege you've all heard me talk about the fact that you have to have the adjustment it's all well and good um having designing a guitar for a particular player with a particular setup and that's that's fine and relatively straightforward he's not going to be the last person that owns that guitar and the next guy might want more relief and it's you're building the guitar for the next guy and the next girl and the next player after that and after that and after that um and that is what the trust rod is about it is flexibility and uh, flexibility is important in my opinion okay uh Jeroen Verhoeven says question speaking of Matt Bellamy in what way does Manson guitars differ from Crimson well quite frankly Crimson guitars is helmed by a charismatic good-looking intelligent individual and uh, and Manson guitars is headed by I'm not sure anymore because it was actually sold Matt Bellamy owns most of it now, if I recall correctly. Um, similar companies. Um, Manson himself was okay. I prefer his brother. His brother's cool. Really cool. Um, they do custom builds entirely and are a guitar shop. I am a custom builder and teacher and tool maker so I don't know it is what it is they, they, they got very very lucky um, in working with Matt and to be frank and I must say this and put this on the public record I think that the Matt Bellamy signature model has one of the ugliest upper horn sort of areas on any guitar I've ever seen in my life it is so nasty in my opinion <sighs> shout at me in the comments if you so wish Kiwi Quarters has come in with another super chat. Thank you very much. Uh, and said, could I get a bespoke guitar kit built at Crimson? Uh, maybe based on a measured drawing, or would that be cost prohibitive uh, based on standard kit cost? Uh, 100%. Uh, and no, not necessarily cost prohibitive. It depends on what you ask for. Uh, but if it's something that we can draw relatively Rephrase. Rewind. Stop. Pause. Start. It's all about time. If you want just a standard outline and you can send us uh, a, a good photograph from directly above the line uh, so that it's, you know, correct and absolutely perfect, we can convert that into a 2D cut path without any problem whatsoever and that's not going to be too expensive if you want a fully carved 3d uh, instrument with sound holes and tone chambers and you know all of that jazz yeah that's probably going to be quite pricey just because that sort of thing takes quite a lot of time to create digitally um, but try us uh, we are 100% up to, to making exactly what you talk about. It's it's on every single kit listing. It says, get in touch with us if you have anything that you want to do that isn't on here. We take custom orders for kits all the time. In fact, we build more custom and customized kits than we do standard, you know, teddies and straps and things. So yeah, get in touch. Whew.
Wow, people, I'm running low. It's been an hour and 40 minutes nearly, uh, minus a short break while the internet died. Um, <laughs> uh, Spikes Guitar Gary says, I just filled up my little car with unleaded for $2.74 here in the US. What are you guys paying? I honestly don't even know, but it's a it's more than that. Robert R says, Ben, how about you building a mini guitar? I'm not going to build a mini guitar, but I am looking at two mini guitars over there. I've got two short scale kids instruments uh, that I'm going to play with very soon. Um, so, yeah. Gramosau and Fobordon says, Ha! I've never had more than an eighth of a tank. Rephrase. I've never had more than an eighth of a tank of fuel in my car. I, uh, yeah. I, I've had, uh, I've had decades like that myself. Redhead17 said, Could you no jog to work? Do you want me to keep on making videos or do you want to find me dead in a ditch on the side of the road? Uh, I live half an hour drive from Crimson Guitars and that would be somewhat of a walk or a jog or a crawl eventually, I'm sure. Uh, and to be frank, I could stay here for, for a month and do everything I need to do apart from meet the new students, which is the only, which is the only thing that I miss uh, by not being a Crimson, really. Uh, everything else is done on the internet and via phone calls and uh, and all of that. So uh, it's it's okay. The biggest issue is actually getting the child to school or not. Dang Nabbit says, I can give you a lift tomorrow. Uh, are you at Crimson? Um, I, I could get a lift if I needed to. Uh, tomorrow, I will be there tomorrow. But I... If I don't find fuel tomorrow, I will not be going anywhere until I find fuel. And that does involve my child not going to school. So, pff, there we go. Tia Buxton says, click like, question mark. Okay, then. <laughs> there we are. 110 likes and 94 viewers. That's more likes than viewers this time. That's what happens when your stream goes down for a little bit in the middle. You lose people. Um, okay, seriously... <laughs> seriously if anybody has a question uh now is the time because i do uh, i do rather fancy my bed at this stage of the evening <sighs> lisa says i've seen a concrete guitar a few years ago those are cool and uh, yes that is a that is cool um uh, Offcut scrap build from uh, Stephen Clark. Scrap build challenge sounds fun. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one day. Marshall Levine says, yes, I've seen those lurking about your shop talking about the um, uh, the Lancashire pattern uh, dividers. Uh, and properly lusted after them. I don't know that I'd ever need them, but they're simply gorgeous. It's, it's, it's one of those things. It really is. They are just so nice um so there we go jeff williams says hand tool build question mark yes i am going to be doing so i've got the watch build that i promised and i'm waiting on i'm waiting on something to happen there um i have got a 90 hour build part two that i want to do as probably a single video to be honest as a bit of a challenge but I am 95% of the way to saying that my next Saturday build is going to be a hand tool only build. Uh, I think I'm quite set on that idea. Talk me out of it. Vulcan Essen has come back in with another five euros. Um, thank you very much, uh, Vulcan. I really appreciate it. it. Says hi Ben. When shopping for your classic hookers, it mentions different spacings and their relation to bridges. Can you elaborate? Off the top of my head, you want me to talk about numbers? Um, you've got, uh, I think it's F and G spacing. You've, you've basically got spacing for standard humbuckers and you've got spacing for, uh, for standard humbuckers and tunematics and that style bridge, which are, I think 56 millimeters and then fender, uh, spacing, which is, I think 54, but 
honestly, I am the last person to talk to about those details. Um, there is a difference between the two uh, with regards to the pole pieces and, and getting the pole pieces to line up with the strings. So, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's something you can have to Google. Uh, okay, now. Uh, Rob Phoenix is coming with five pounds uh, just to say thank you for making me buy a box of random old planes. <laughs> Send me a photo, Rob. Um, it's a multifaceted problem I have. I had a conversation with my wife yesterday. Uh, I'm, I'm seriously considering whether I want to keep the tool shop going or, or not. Uh, or, or maybe actually fold it into Crimson Guitars and just have everything managed out of one company because that would just be simpler, to be frank. But she said, Ben, if you don't have the tool shop, then you're going to be spending your money on stuff that you can't then sell because you just love buying things. And it really is. I love going and hunting and buying buying things and buying a box of random old planes fills me with excitement and it's not only because of hey you've got something cool and new like a Lancashire pattern divider or something like that it's about wondering if you've got a bit of treasure in there and that's why I want to see your photo I want to see if you've got a bit of treasure you might have a you know a 1900s um, it's a type 7 number 4 or something that's worth hundreds of dollars and it's the hunt. It's a treasure hunt. And, uh, yeah, it gives me a good old rush, it does. Um, so, anyway, thank you very much for the super chat, Rob. And uh, I, I'm i glad that you're enjoying your box of old planes. I really am. <sighs> Creeper, I says, yeah, I'm a little tired as well. It's been a hard day. I uh, hope you're okay, dude. Uh, Alexis Guitar says, question, what grade sandpaper should I sand a neck to if I plan to finish it with crimson finishing oil? You do not need to go any higher than, at most, 320 grit for any finish. Any finish at all. 320 grit is, by it's, that's it. Uh, that's what I do. You can stop at 240 if you so fancy, but 320 is around about it. Any higher than that, and you start polishing the wood, and finishers don't necessarily like adhering to uh, too highly polished wood. It just doesn't. So, uh, so yeah. Paul Williams uh, says, isn't it illegal here to buy hookers? Classic hookers, designed by Sam Hook. They're pickups, dude. It's a risque, funny name. Come on. Uh, yes. How about a baritone semi-hollow body at 30-inch scale? That sounds... That sounds fun. That does. Stephen Clark says, 320 US grit created a great finish with their penetrating oil. Thank you very much, Stephen. Gibson, 50 millimeters, Fender, 52 millimeters. Did I say? I said 46. No, I said 54 and 55. So that's the bridge spacing rather than... Hmm. Where did I get those numbers from? As I've said, I am bad with numbers. So thank you, Elliot, for setting me right. Uh... <laughs> Rob Phoenix says, I've got no idea what is in that box of planes, but I couldn't resist. Damn you. <laughs> Seriously, send me a photo and I'll, I will tell you if you've got anything in. Uh, send it to stream at crimsonguitars.com if you fancy. Uh, Dennis Chamarkin has come in with another super chat and said, how can I safely remove lacquer from a neck? I was not smart enough to buy a kit with no finish. Smiley face. Uh, It's just a neck. You could probably just sand it down, to be honest, without too much work. And that's safer than using heat. Uh, fire is your next best friend. But if the wood wasn't perfectly dried, if it isn't perfect wood, which is often the case with kits, then 
the heat required to loosen the lacquer so that you can get it off and scrape it off and all that jazz is uh, is also going to potentially warp and distort the neck and cause issues. Um, now, the first time I ever removed finish from an instrument, it was uh, an old ovation that fell in the river and um, it was a bowl back, so it was fine, but the top, the lacquer was, was destroyed. And I went and uh, I took a I took a hunting knife I had. Uh, let me put that down. And I took a good sharp blade like this uh, Leatherman uh, Free T4 uh, with a curved blade. And I used the sharp blade to scrape all of the finish off. And actually, that would be probably faster and better at removing the bulk of a thick lacquer off a neck than uh, than sandpaper even and certainly better for your lungs and fun you'll just uh, make your blade blunt which is an issue so uh, yeah i'd say scrape it with a sharp knife or just a scraper if you've got a scraper okie dokie Are neck routing jigs any good? It depends on the jig. Can Crimson ship, ship out to the USA uh, without damaging the instrument? Yeah, absolutely. Um, better said, how do you get that guitar to the customer in sweet factory condition she left? Lol. Uh, we ship in custom-made cases built for us by Hiscox with Crimson branding on them, which is cool. Uh, they are incredible cases and uh, take a lot of damage. Those cases are those cases are also uh, boxed very carefully and uh, bubble wrapped and all that jazz. And yeah, we ship guitars um, internationally on a regular basis. And uh, uh, touch wood for for a number of years, we haven't had any issues. Uh, the, I think the last time we had a major issue with shipping was easily a decade ago. So, uh, yeah, it's all good. Why? Lewis, what am I building for you? Uh, Narbon Guitars, or... Yeah, Narbon Guitars says, How do you set the back taper on frets when levelling at the 12th fret? So, you're talking about uh, fall away from the sort of... 15th or 16th fret onwards you want uh, a ramp going down towards the top of the guitar uh, to allow it just makes everything play better essentially what i do is i put uh, three layers uh, of masking tape across the 11th and 12th fret and a piece of masking tape on the back of half of my leveling beam and that cancel leveling beam at that angle and you just go and you're done Alexis Guitar says, I've heard Alder is generally too soft for a neck. Oh, yes. Would making it uh, two to three pieces be okay? No, it is still soft. Uh, laminating it, yes, does make it a little bit stronger, for sure. Um, and laminating it using a couple of strips of veneer as well as glue would make it stronger yet. But unless you're going to put hefty amounts of carbon fiber in and dual action truss rods, I just wouldn't do it. Um, the only time I've seen softwoods like that used successfully in a neck is when it has then subsequently been wrapped in carbon fiber. Ivan Wizard, Carl, five euros, <laughs> says, go to bed, Ben. I want to go to the pub. I would say you're saving me money staying on longer, so take this chat as a pint for yourself or buy a pumpkin. Um, I'm going to go... I'm going to go and have a have a, a, a crafty bottle of beer myself and uh, I am going to take this as a cue to go to bed. You can go to the pub and uh, yeah, I don't have enough fuel to get to a pub. Um, okay, dude, thank you very much. Uh, final, final, final questions. Okay. Lisa says, what's the staff situation for Crimson, please? Uh, Short-staffed, but uh, seems to be okay at the moment. Uh, 
drop me an email stream at crimsonguitars.com if there's anything in particular you're wondering about we are still a little bit behind on some tools um, but there are various different reasons we, we've also got uh, horrendous issues with with um, uh, shipping stuff around just in the in the UK let alone the world at the moment so there are some things that we're waiting for that should have been here months ago that just aren't um, but if it's a specific product or question please drop us an email and we'll get back to you as soon as a day guitar says question is it best to round over slash soften the frets of the the edges of the fretboard before or after installing the frets I've tried both ways and not sure um, I Before we'll get you a more homogenous feel, basically, because you then the fret ends then are brought into a round over that is all the way along. If you do it afterwards, you tend to go like that, which is what I do because I like the feel of that. I've never really even considered it, which is why I paused there. I've never done it before. I'm not sure. Huh. Okay. Uh, Martin Gabriel Turon Rendo says, Hi Ben, I just got here a little bit late. Sorry, I'm just going to bed. Uh, got my tools from Crimson some days ago. Uh, thank you very much for your support. Uh, out from home working, I can't wait to return to my wife and my new tools and put them back to work. You've got that in the right order. You can't wait to return to your wife and your new tools. Uh, I appreciate your support and uh, I wish you speed until you get to your workshop. Um, there's there's a, an inspiration thing that you get from a new tool, whether it's a, a new tool to make guitars or a new plane or a new guitar. When you get a new guitar, you play furiously a lot more than you normally would for months and months and months because that you got that honeymoon period it's the same thing with tools i love it um uh, so there we go huh. lisa says the website exclamation point that's a very good point uh yeah the website is still not ideal um actually that's something else to go for okay everybody uh, Borgonian Evolution says, have a great week, everybody. Stay safe and healthy, etc., etc., etc. Talking Rad Knox, have fun storming the castle. Looking forward to seeing the new build of Crimson. Everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, we have had a good evening. I have had a fantastic... Uh, this, is, this is a highlight of my week. I really love seeing you all here. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. Please, have a good one. I love you all. Um, good night.